So good afternoon. Thank you for joining. This uh, session is going to be uh, common networking operations across Kubernetes and OpenStack with Calico. It's a really good echo in here. It's like, it's, imagine being an announcer at a, a stadium. So, so my name is Mark Baker. I'm part of product strategy at Canonical. Uh, with me, I'm joined with Karthik, who's a, a Calico expert, who's so director of solutions at architecture at Tigera. And we have Larry, who's uh, um, uh, working on OpenStack Helm and various other container initiatives at AT&T. And finally, Steve, who's also doing the same. So we're going to um, uh, talk about a number of different topics. First off, if I kick off, i uh, talk about uh, Ubuntu OpenStack. So Ubuntu produces an OpenStack distribution, as I'm sure you know. Um, and that's been successful out there in the market with a lot of people using it. But increasingly, we've seen people wanting to be able to connect that with containers. And so whether that's running uh, containers inside OpenStack, alongside OpenStack, underneath OpenStack, the interaction of OpenStack with containers is a challenge that many people are looking to try and address today. Um, and in fact, I have a nice build that uh, uh, emphasizes this. Uh, containers throughout uh, uh, Canonical or Ubuntu OpenStack today, we have them at the control plane. So we've been running Ubuntu OpenStack in LXE containers for many, many years, several years, I should say. Uh, in fact, many of the production deployments we have at telcos around the world are in LXE containers. So we have a containerized control plane. Um, but now we're looking at how can we bring that into sort of immutable containers with, with technologies like Docker um, or Cola, I should say. But we also have them at other layers throughout the stack, too. And we see customers deploying them in the same way. So whether it's using LXE containers on top of KVM, whether it's using uh, LexD containers, i.e. machine containers, with a hypervisor called Nova LexD, which I'll talk about in a second, or whether it's running Kubernetes on top of OpenStack. Containers are, uh, are sprinkled liberally throughout our OpenStack deployment. Now, anybody that's been using uh, OpenStack for a little while knows that successful OpenStack requires successful networking. And I'm sure the same is true of Kubernetes too. So figuring out how these things work together has been very important. Um, for those of you not familiar, the different types of containers that actually we saw in that previous diagram, um, we see virtual machines, of course, uh, based with KVM. They have networking implications. Machine containers, which is essentially a VM, but it's using container primitives, but looks and behaves just like a VM, uh, with technologies like LexD or, or perhaps OpenVZ, if you know that. Process containers, things like Docker and Rocket, which I'm sure you know and love already. And then uh, different styles of application containers in the uh, uh, IoT space or, or, or embedded space, things like Snappy and Flatpak in there. We're going to be primarily talking about the process containers, so Docker containers here, how we can network Kubernetes environments and OpenStack environments together. I'll skip through that. We do use uh, LexD with OpenStack, so machine containers with OpenStack. If you want to be able to run uh, full machine containers in conjunction with OpenStack, we can do that using this LexD technology. Um, so this is slightly separate from running Kubernetes, um, but it's networked in the same way. So all, everything you'll hear will apply in a very similar way. And finally, um, with Kubernetes. So as I said, we see a lot of the, the customers are engaging with OpenStack today, looking at Kubernetes, um, deploying that on top of or alongside. Um, and so if that's something that you're interested in doing, the solutions, the things that we're talking about over the next half hour, um, the integrations between these technologies are both with canonical Kubernetes, with Ubuntu OpenStack, and of course, their upstream uh, fathers. So let's look at the three types. And Karthik is, is going to deal with these in, the, in, in more detail as I pass, when I pass over in a second. Um, those, those three scenarios. So and in fact, let's ask the audience. Um, put your hand up. If you're running Kubernetes alongside an existing OpenStack, I'll say that again, alongside an existing OpenStack on bare metal. Have you, is anybody doing that today? OK, good opportunity for Kubernetes distributions there. Thank you. Uh, is anybody running Kubernetes inside of OpenStack today? OK, that's good. And anybody running Kubernetes, uh, OpenStack in Kubernetes, so using things like Cola and, and whatever? OK, so a good, good mix. And somebody doing all three over there. Good. Brave man. So. Um, <laughs> At this point, as I say, you'll know that uh, whatever way you're doing it, getting the networking right is going to drive success. Or rather, getting it wrong is going to cause you lots of headaches and sleepless nights. So, um, with that, I'm going to hand across to 
Karthik from Tigera, who's going to introduce Calico and how they've been addressing some of these problems. Uh, absolutely. So, first of all, to introduce Tigera, Tigera is the company behind Project Calico, which is a pure layer three approach to networking. It's a very simple and scalable approach. Uh, but we also co-maintainers of Flannel, we're co-maintainers of CNI, which is the networking abstraction used in Kubernetes. And before we sort of dive into Calico a little bit, I want to give you a little bit of context for how Calico came about, or rather, what is what are some of the approaches that have been taken previously in the, from the early days of virtual machine networking. And specifically in the early days of VM networking, and this is, by the way, a standard Neutron with open vSwitch slide, and you can see the amount of complexity there in terms of bridges, vSwitches, overlays, security enforcement points, and so on. And the reason you had this complexity, in the early days of VM networking, if you needed two uh, applications to talk to each other, you put them in an overlay. You expose the virtual network concept to users, and then you sort of conflate isolation with network topology. And so as a result, as your applications grew, the number of overlays grew, and then you started adding layers of complexity. And then you start looking at things like east-to-west flows and north-south flows, and then you had things like virtual routing to be able to get between overlays, and the, the thing soon becomes a total mess, as I'm sure many of you guys know. If, you, if like me, you've spent nights and weekends troubleshooting open vSwitch and why packets going in a virtual wire don't come out the other end, you know what I'm talking about, right? So that fundamentally is an artifact of the fact that people have sort of conflated isolation with network topology, and doing that by creating overlays and complex overlay networking. And as we move to microservices, that overlay approach starts to break down, because if you look at the, more, the larger microservices deployments, and this is a picture from Netflix from a few years ago, this concept of creating overlays for individual application instances or groups of application instances that need to communicate, and that does not scale from a networking perspective, right? And so what you'll find is that the container orchestrators like Kubernetes have taken a fundamentally different approach towards networking. And it started with Kubernetes, but all of the other container platforms are moving in the same direction, which is to assume things like uh, an IP per pod or an IP per container, depending on which orchestrator you're talking about. In Kubernetes, it's an IP per pod. You assume that the communication between pods within the cluster is over IP, and those IP addresses are unique within the cluster. We assume the world is IP, right? That's the fundamental assumption. And the second major difference is that all of the container orchestrators are moving in this direction. Kubernetes has chosen to start in this sort of a model, which is to have a separate set of policy constructs that applications can declare, typically in a YAML syntax, in terms of what sort of isolation they want. So Kubernetes has these concept of labels and selectors, and then you can create network policy that defines what should talk to what. So if you have an LDAP server or a bunch of LDAP servers or objects labeled LDAP servers, and you have a bunch of objects labeled LDAP clients, and you have a label production or QE, then network policy, you can define things like, I want all LDAP servers to talk to all LDAP clients as long as they are in production and they are all labeled project A, right? So you sort of decouple isolation from networking. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to move to a much more simple network fabric with scales. And an example of that is Calico. So what is Calico? Calico is a pure layer three networking abstraction built for cloud-native platforms. Uh, we work across multiple cloud-native platforms. Certainly, Kubernetes tends to have Calico as one of the most popular network plugins. So today, in most Kubernetes deployments, you'll see typically Calico being the de network plugin of choice. But Calico also works with OpenStack. It works with Docker. It works with Mesos. It works, uh, it works across multiple orchestrators. And so the way it works is typically we use the plugin mechanism defined by the orchestrator. In Kubernetes, it is CNI. In OpenStack, it is Neutron. In, and other orchestrators, Mesos also has adopted CNI. So depending on the orchestrator, we use the plugin mechanism. And we create virtual ethernets that connect. In fact, I have a slide coming up on this. We, use, we basically connect the workload of virtual machine in OpenStack, a pod in Kubernetes, directly to the host namespace using virtual ethernets. And we treat every compute node or every worker node in Kubernetes as a router. 
basically had routes in the host routing table pointing to the workload, and we advertised those routes within the cluster using standard internet routing protocol, specifically BGP. And this is within the Kubernetes or within the OpenStack cluster. Super simple, we don't use OpenV switches, we don't use bridges, no complex overlays, keep things extremely simple. And so if you think back to the picture I showed earlier about Neutron with OpenV switch, and you look at a similar picture for Kubernetes networking, this is it. Every node is a router. We use the standard Linux routing table. What Calico does is it creates routes in the routing table pointing to the local pods on that host. And then we have a daemon called Bird, which is a BGP daemon, which creates BGP peering amongst the Calico nodes that exchanges routes with each other. So all nodes in the cluster know how to reach a given pod using its IP address. Extremely simple. And surprise, surprise, when you look at Calico for Neutron, it's exactly the same architecture. No vSwitches, no bridges, no complex overlays, no tunnels. So that's from a networking perspective. We've radically simplified networking. And now for isolation, the way we do isolation is using policy. In the case of Kubernetes, we actually use Kubernetes network policy. And the reason for that is because the team, that, the team behind Project Calico helped develop, uh, helped develop the network policy implementation for Kubernetes and the design for it. So you'll find that Kubernetes network policy mirrors Calico's policy infrastructure almost identically, right? And in the case of Neutron, because Neutron has more core strain artifacts like security groups, it's not nearly as dynamic as something like Kubernetes' network policy and labels and selectors, uh, we have a concept called profiles, which is mapping security groups into profiles. From an overall operations perspective, Calico, like I said, the focus is both on simplicity and scalability. The way you deploy Calico on Kubernetes, if you go back and look at the recording of the session I did yesterday, which is introduction of Kubernetes networking for open stackers, I did a live demo of deploying a Kubernetes cluster across multiple nodes with networking, with Calico networking, and that took two minutes. It's three commands, right? The networking portion of that is one command, kubectl apply calico.yaml. If you take more than two minutes to deploy a simple Kubernetes cluster, chances are you're doing something wrong, right? The focus is simplicity. And the way you operate Calico in production is you use the tools that you've used for network planning and engineering and operations and monitoring for the last 30, 40 years. There is a lot of thought that's gone into building out network tooling. We are not creating complex overlays. We're not creating overlays and overlays. We're doing simple IP routing. And so what that means is all the tooling that people have built up over the years can be directly leveraged with Calico, okay? Huge, huge win uh, in terms of operational scalability. And from a troubleshooting perspective, troubleshooting container networking with something like Calico, or even networking in OpenStack with Calico, is no different than troubleshooting when your laptop is unable to connect to the internet. Can I ping my destination? If I cannot ping, let's do a trace route and see where packets are being dropped. And at that point, you're looking, if it's being dropped on the host, you look at, is there a routing table entry for the destination? If there is, is there a policy rule that's preventing that traffic from being received at a destination? That policy rule is simply IP tables. Actually, IP sets for scalability, we use IP sets, not IP tables. So it's a really simple, a really simple approach from both a deployment, operations, and troubleshooting perspective. And for those of you who have deployed Neutron with OVS and all of the complex layer three approaches on top of that, this is something you will really appreciate. So coming sort of the scenarios of deploying OpenStack side by side with uh, Kubernetes or one on top of the other. So just going into some of these scenarios with Calico, there's two sorts of things you have to think about. One is how do you network the workloads? So how do you network sort of workloads happening in Kubernetes and connect them with workloads in OpenStack? And that's one aspect. And the second aspect is how do you provide isolation between them? when you have different flows, different projects, how do you provide isolation, especially when those applications are running in both domains, okay? From a Calico perspective, because the networking is really simple, every workload, whether it's in OpenStack or in Kubernetes, has an IP address, we use standard IP routing. All it is is IP routing. If you'd like, you can, you can uh, peer across them or you can use your infrastructure. If you're running in a public cloud, it's perfectly fine. It's IP routing. 
It doesn't matter whether your clusters are in the same data center or in data centers at the other end of the planet. It's simple IP, right? We know how to do IP routing at scale. It's a solved problem. This should be no different, right? So that's one part of it. From a policy and isolation part of it, um, the way Calico does it is we, like I said, we use network policy in Kubernetes. In OpenStack, we actually map OpenStack security groups to profiles in Calico's uh, Key, key value store. So in our data model, we have the concept of workloads, which could be in Kubernetes, which could be in OpenStack, but we have a common data store, and that common data store for us typically is XED. So as long as you have a common data store, XED, across both OpenStack and Kubernetes that is managed as part of Calico, you can define through the use of labels and profiles in terms of what needs to talk to what. So if you have an LDAP server on OpenStack talking to an LDAP set of LDAP clients on Kubernetes, which are being spun up and down, and these are changing dynamically as your microservices require them, Calico dynamically adjusts to keeping that uh, policy control and enforcing that through IP sets across the infrastructure. So it's a really simple way to scale your, your um, isolation and do that at the very end point dynamically based on how your workloads are spinning up across multiple orchestrators. So to give you a sort of a pictorial illustration, networking is really simple. It's IP routing, nothing to it. And we use policy defined typically in YAML syntax uh, for Kubernetes or mapping OpenStack security groups with things like tags into a common policy model. And by the way, the same approach will also work when parts of your application are also running on host Linux instances. So if you have an Ubuntu Linux instance running in the cloud somewhere, you can have the policy part of Calico also apply there and apply the same IP6 rules there. So as you have, say, a database running in the, in the in a host Linux instance, maybe cl database clients running on Kubernetes and on OpenStack, all of them, the policy is enforced dynamically at the very end point as instances come up and down and it's enforced at both sides of that, of that connection, or all sides of that connection. So it's a very distributed, dynamic, there are no centralized SDN controllers, it's truly distributed, it's truly dynamic, so that keeps up with your, with your cloud as you have instances coming up, up and down. With Kubernetes running, Kubernetes nodes running inside virtual machines in OpenStack, again, there's different approaches you can take. If you have an existing OpenStack installation with an existing SDN, you could absolutely keep, keep using that, run Calico for the Kubernetes, which most, uh, Calico is one of the more popular uh, network implementations for Kubernetes. And essentially, you would run Calico inside as part of a Kubernetes installation. Keep it really simple. But if you want to get even more sophisticated and you're looking for a simpler networking solution for OpenStack as well, guess what? You can run Calico for OpenStack. And at this point, the way you connect the two is you simply do BGP peering between Calico running on Kubernetes to Calico running on OpenStack. As far as Calico on the, on the BGP instance inside the Kubernetes node thinks, it's just talking to a top of rack switch. It's that same concept. So it's simple IP routing, it's routes in the Linux routing table and normal packet forwarding. The data path is totally, so Calico is not in a data path. Calico just sets up the routes and it's simple IP routing, right? So super simple, and then you use the common XCD data store to enforce policy between applications running in Kubernetes and those running in, in OpenStack. And then sort of the interesting, one of the use cases which I think is emerging much more rapidly these days and something that AT&T is gonna talk about is when you run OpenStack as a containerized application on top of Kubernetes. And again, it's sort of from a Calico perspective, it's the same sort of models, simple network peering with BGP, and policy with something like the Calico policy model applied across both Kubernetes and OpenStack, but I'll hand over to the at t folks to give more uh, detail around this. Sure. By the way, I see a few faces in absolute shock. It, it's not possible to make Neutron this simple, is it? Yeah, so we're gonna be doing a little bit of a demo today for you guys, uh, but before that, we should talk about the environment. So uh, we're right, uh, right now we're running a three-node cluster 
running Ubuntu 16.04 on bare metal. Our CNI we're leveraging is Calico, so Calico is providing the BGP mesh that our nodes are communicating on, uh, as well as the network policy that Karthik talked about. Uh, additionally, it's worth noting that Calico supports, or our cluster was created using kubeadmin, and Calico has a hosted kubeadmin manifest that it's one command and it'll apply the, uh, the nodes, it'll configure the nodes with the ACLs, uh, also, it'll set up an etcd instance for you as well as the policy controller. So. So we already have a, uh, oops, misclick. <laughs> so we already have a uh, version of OpenStack installed uh, running Mataka and we have an instance created. Uh, the instance has a floating IP associated with it, and at the end of the day, all this is a web server that's running. Uh, we have a video that's loaded onto it so we can show during the upgrade, there is no service disruption. Start that. Yeah. And we're also going to start a script that will. Is that good, by the way? And in the back, are you able to see? Okay. So this script is just going to keep uh, calling Keystone asking for a token. We're going to kick off our upgrade to Newton. Real estate is at a premium here. and we're going to start a ping on that VM that's running. So now the upgrade is happening. All right. <clears throat> so now you can see that some of the pods are being descheduled as the liveliness probes and the readiness probes are being kicked off. So the, you also see some uh, new pods coming up in the init state. So of course our init container is going to run, and it's basically going to make sure the dependencies for these new pods that are going to be scheduled are met. So we're going to check for the, the keystone jobs are complete. We're going to check that, uh, well, of course, the database is going to come back up before the pods are rescheduled. And if I remember right, this does happen pretty quick once the pods get terminated. 
this entire process usually takes about three to five minutes. So. Yeah, but the, the big takeaway, like Larry mentioned, is uh, the video is still running. Uh, we're going to be able to keep getting a token from Keystone, and that's because we're leveraging rolling updates here. So with rolling updates, it's going to make sure that it gradually moves a service or a deployment down one replica at a time and replaces it so there's no interruption to the service at all. So if you're looking at this in terms of um, keeping your availability high for your, your OpenStack deployments, it's, it's pretty important and it's also a pretty, pretty awesome thing to watch, especially as you're doing upgrades. I think there was a quick question here, or would you want to take questions now or later? Sure. Got time. <laughs> yeah, it's, um... Yeah, repeat the question. So the question oh, was, can you, can you sort of explain what's happening in behind the scenes to make this sort of magic happen? Sure. You want to take this? Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it's what Steve just touched on with the yeah. rolling upgrades. It's slowly tearing down uh, pods one by one, making sure that at least one version or one replica of that pod is always able to serve requests. No, it's, uh, sorry, the sorry, question was, is, uh, am I corrected? It's happening because it's replacing them faster than they're being torn down. Uh, it's, it's, how, it's a built-in mechanism with rolling updates with Kubernetes. So if you have a deployment that is using a rolling update, it will never schedule fewer than one. So as it's tearing them down, it will leave at least one replica up. So that service always maintains an entry in the load balancer so it can serve requests. So it's it's... Not a matter of speed, it's just a built-in feature for Kubernetes with the API, so it can make sure that there's something there always to serve the request. So I think it's done running. Um, if we look here, the token's likely expired, but... Yeah, so you can see that Okay, yeah, so you can see that the uh, formerly gray side menu bar over here uh, is now the Newton bootstrap blue theme. Uh, our VM is still running, still serving. Uh, the video stream hasn't been interrupted. We can check uh, there was no packet loss on the ping to the VM, so there was no service disrup disruption on our VM workload. All right, that's it. We some. So, in a few minutes, we should probably take a few questions mm -hmm. as well. But I also want to leave you with some sort of parting thoughts, Mark. I'm sure you can add some as well. So, this is obviously a pretty, uh, in my opinion, a hugely impressive demo to have a containerized OpenStack deployed very quickly with simple networking and do sort of a live upgrade while an application is running. And to be able to pull off a demo like this on stage, I think is super impressive, right? That's sort of your moment of truth. Can you do this live on stage and have it work, right? I, I kind of had my heart in my hands, but you guys <laughs> seem pretty comfortable. Um, so this is sort of like where the future is going. Join the community. OpenStack Helm, there's a lot of activity going on. Calico as well, strong and thriving open source community. Join us. Obviously, Canonical is a uh, good supporter of, of this whole, whole initiative. So, Thanks Questions? for the presentation. Uh, I was just wondering, is this out of the box OpenStack Helm, or is there any, did you guys make any edits to make it work like this well? Uh, this should be out of the box. Cool. So a, a question about using um, Calico as a controller for OpenStack. So you mentioned you don't have, you don't use virtual bridges. Uh, so I was just wondering. The, sorry, the, don't use what, sorry? You mentioned you're not using virtual bridges. Correct, house switches, yep. Right. 
or switches. So um, I was just wondering, so the, the virtual machine is running on the compute nodes. Uh, mm -hmm. So where do you get the networking ports from? Yeah, so what we do is we essentially create virtual Ethernet connecting to the uh, workloads network namespace, the VM's network namespace, down to the host namespace. And essentially what we do is we, we have routes in the Linux routing table that says to reach that workloads IP address, send traffic into that virtual Ethernet. So it's really simple, no complex bridges or v-switches or combinations of bridges and v-switches. And we essentially do, the, do our IP6 rules, IP tables rule IP6 actually, at that uh, entry point into the workload. So we actually do it at the very edge. So using Linux na namespaces? Correct. Okay. We absolutely use Linux namespaces. And when you, when you have um, VMs and different hypervisors connecting to you know, the same virtual network, that is, how's that traffic isolated from other virtual networks? The, so first of all, in terms of different hypervisors, every workload essentially has an IP address. And the way the networking works is simple IP routing. The isolation is with policy, which in the case of OpenStack is artifacts like security groups. When you have a security group that says you allow this traffic in, we have the concept also of tags in Calico, where you can uh, do a little bit more uh, labeling. The same thing in Kubernetes is with a more sophisticated set of labels, but OpenStack doesn't have the concept of labels to that same degree. So it's basically mapping security groups to say, hey, this workload should be, uh, has this security group which gets mapped into a profile, which is something applied to a workload in um, Calico. And that profile can be applied across multiple um, virtual machines and multiple nodes. And essentially, that same profile is enforced at the endpoints uh, at the virtual Ethernet which connect to the workload. And, and last question, I promise. Uh, and no. So, but you, you can still have a um, same layer two broadcast across multiple hypervisors? So, Calico is a pure layer three solution. It doesn't, it's not focused on layer two. It doesn't use bridges. So essentially every node in the Calico domain, you can consider it a router, right? So it's a pure layer three solution. A question right here. Uh, does your upgrade involve any database schema changes? And if yes, uh, how is that done? Yeah, so every time you run an upgrade or even an install for that matter, we have a set of jobs that run for every service. So. We have a DB init, which is going to start. It's going to create the user, grant them permissions. And then we have a DB sync, which is going to prep the schema for the version of that container for whatever service it has. So these are um, what kind of jobs? Are these Kubernetes jobs? Yes, Kubernetes jobs that we use init containers to check dependencies. OK. And does Cola provide that uh, out of the box? Is, is it a feature of Cola? Or uh, sorry, the OpenStack uh, Helm? Those scripts or those um, init jobs, the, what, the, what project is that part of? Yeah, the dependency checking. Uh, in the past, we had used Stackinetti's entry point. I think right now in master for OpenStack Helm, we're leveraging Cola Toolbox. It has a dependency checking application in it. OK, thanks. Um, okay. So Calico being a layer three solution, can you talk to how that may or may not impact um, technologies, acceleration technologies like DPTK, SRIOV? Sure. OV? sure. Uh, that's actually, a, a, I'll answer it in two parts. The really simple answer is that Calico, what, the way Calico does networking is it programs routes into a Linux kernel, essentially normal Linux routing. So the data path for a flows, application flows is the normal Linux data path. Calico does not, uh, uh, Unless you're Calico can also work if you have things like uh, IP IP tunnels or IPsec tunnels, and there's other ways you can have as a transport, but it's not required. So Calico policy can still apply on that. But in the in the default case where you're, simp you're using simple IP routing and simple packet forwarding in Linux, Calico is not in the data path. And so what that means is, uh, very uh, depending on the technology you're using, uh, if you're using accelerated data paths those generally just work, right? And even if you're not using, even if you're not using acceleration, the thing to keep in mind is because Calico is not in the data path, 
unlike something like an overlay network plugged into open vSwitch where every packet gets encapsulated into an overlay, Calico is not doing any of that stuff, right? It's, so even in the default case, generally you get much better performance with Calico because typically it's, it's whatever your Linux router can do, which is normal packet forwarding. Does it help? Yeah. Uh, I had a question regarding uh, uh, service function chaining or service insertion and that kind of stuff. So how would it work in OpenStack? Because Calico has a Neutron plugin, right? So it probably has to do something for that. And also just on a pure Kubernetes environment, like how does service insertion, service chaining work? Yeah, there's different ways you can do that. That's actually a more complex question. And I think there's different sorts of use cases to get into there. So let's start by talking a bit on the Kubernetes side. Kubernetes, you have the concept of services in Kubernetes, which is uh, depending on whether you're using cluster virtual IPs and node ports or load balancers, there's sort of different ways you can do services. So uh, typically those services get, you work with something like QProxy, which does the translation, and sort of, and QProxy just works with Calico. They work at different layers. The Calico works on the workload IPs and QProxy basically works, also works using IP tables, but they work with each other. Calico is fully compatible. You'll find some network plugins in Kubernetes have to replace QProxy. That's not the case with Calico, it just works. Now, that said, there's more advanced things you can do. And as an, exa an example I'll call out in the case of uh, Kubernetes is uh, you find that some load balancers, for example, FI being uh, called FI out, they have the ability to do things like BGP peering. So they actually have written up a document on how you do BGP peering between FI load balancers and Calico so the FI can do more intelligent things with how they get traffic into and out of the cluster. So there's different approaches that you can take to optimize sort of your uh, different elements of your network. Uh, same thing again in, in OpenStack, Calico does certain things and does it well. There's other things you can do sort of outside of Calico, which are again, it's, it's, it's a function of how you architect your overall network. Um, Depending on what sort of specific service functions you're looking to get chained, happy to talk to you offline. I might have some recipes for you. Reach out to us on, we have a Calico users uh, public Slack channel as well. And reach out to us there. We'd be happy to give you some more detail on some other possibilities. Yep, actually, let's, let's do it. It is good to see that Calico can handle the Neutron security group. Can it handle the Neutron firewall service as well? Uh, um, so, so the way you would do this in Calico is essentially Calico is providing a policy implementation. So you use Calico policy typically. So for example, uh, um, Neutron Firewall as a service, I, I, ha I haven't looked at that recently, but generally users would use Calico policy to provide that same function up to, up to users. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions, if I may, depending on how much time we have. One is, uh, do you use, how, how do you solve uh, overlapping IPs across tenants? Do you use something like multi-protocol BGP or whatever? Yeah. Um, and the second one is related to L2. Uh, for VLAN aware VMs, do you handle that? Is there any implication? Yeah, let me answer, uh, let me take the second one first and I'll come to the second, first one as well. So uh, you can do your layer two sort of abstractions on the need from a physical network fabric. Uh, Essentially, think of every Calico node as a router. So it's a super clean architecture. If you want to peer your routers over an L2 fabric with uh, uh, leaf spine L2 architecture, great. Uh, more people these days, the general approach in the industry, even outside of cloud infrastructure, when you look at the web scale providers, most of them are moving towards L3 all the way to the edge, not just the top of rack. When you look at the large web scale providers, they're moving to L3 up to, into the servers as well, right? And so the Calico really f fits that model. Now, if you want to use VLANs on the physical infrastructure and do other, other things, it's not required. It's, uh, it's you're typically making your network more complex, but there's different reasons why people tend to do that, and that's fine. Uh, coming to your other question, overlapping IPs, uh, there are approaches that Cal can, Calico can use for overlapping IP address spaces. Calico does not support overlapping IPs today. That's not in our current product set. There are ways we can do that. But surprisingly, we have Calico deployed on some very large service provider scale infrastructures. And we have yet to rec get, some, get requests from service providers saying, oh, you need to do overlapping IPs. And the reason is this. The world we are moving to is a cloud native world. 
the kinds of workloads being moved out into the cloud and into cloud-like infrastructures are workloads where you have instances coming up and down. And in a clean IP layer three model like Calico, when you can keep the networking really simple and do policy independent of networking, you can essentially get, get that same effect using policy and a simple networking fabric. So to answer your question, Calico does not do overlapping IP support today. It's something that we actually have uh, something scoped out, but we haven't had to implement that yet. I think. Um, Mark, I think, any? No, no, no. I think we're, uh, we're over time now. So um, uh, we'll obviously hang around here if you want uh, any follow up questions. But just like to say thank you very much to Karthik for presenting Calico pieces and uh, uh, both Steve and, and Larry for giving us a great demo. If you have any questions, please, please follow up with us here. Great. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you.